director of the Lake Tahoe Center for Spiritual Living. Let's welcome Tim Schubert. I spoke here about a month ago, and it was pouring rain. Last night, as we were staring out of the heavens opening up, I thought, I think I have a new calling. I am the rainmaker. <laughs> Fortunately, we have beautiful sunshine today and a, a lovely audience, and I'm pleased to be here. After the talk I gave last month, several people asked me where, what book did I get this out of, and what, what, where is this from? And the truth is, a lot of it I've made up, but I've made it up under the influence, under the influence of two particular people very strongly, Bill Wilson and Ernest Holmes. And kind of secondarily, looking at the ancestors, Carl Jung and, and Albert Einstein. More proximally, I've been influenced by a lot of people. Two recent ones happen to be Ken Wilber, whom I've been reading. Anybody familiar with Ken Wilber's work? And by David Byron. And I was quite struck by both his talk and, his, and I read his book about it something I'd never do, which is right on a motorcycle off the edge of the earth. <laughs> and by people that I associate with. We have conversations at our center and in other areas, and those I see as wisdom circles. Not because any of us are wise, particularly, some are, but, but most of us are fools, like all of us. But because there is wisdom among us, and I enjoy those conversations. So those are, those are my references. So I got interested in consciousness through a series of events that I had not anticipated. As a young person, I had certain characteristics. One, I was very smart. Two, I was very introverted. So I went about life accumulating knowledge and being successful in school, which gave me a position in life and some control over life, because I could learn about things, and in knowing about them, I felt a sense of, of being in control of my life. The other part of that was that I was basically very afraid. There was a lot of fear in me, which I didn't recognize as fear, because having fear was not considered a particularly useful or, 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 or a very good thing to have, so I decided that it was best to be fearless, so on the outside I was, but on the inside there was just a tremendous amount of fear. Now, I was quite successful in certain ways and got what I thought was about happiness was about, what I had learned and was conditioned to believe. So happiness is creating the circumstances around you to be a good life, having enough food. What was it that Rousseau wanted food? A good cooking, for sure. Good, a, a good bank account. I included sex, booze, and, and, and rock and roll as being part of the good life. I wanted those, and a few other things, a car and a house and kids. I, those were things that I thought would make me happy. And I got those and then had a crisis. The crisis was partly because I became a, a hopeless addict alcoholic, which is, if any of you have experienced that, it's a, it's a very unsettling experience. And I realized that I wasn't happy. It's hard to know how much of it was that I was trying to seek happiness in the wrong places, or if it was because I was trying to seek happiness in the wrong places. But however it added up, it became clear that it wasn't working. So I became a little bit open to something else. Now, I didn't know what else. I ended up in a 12-step program because I didn't know what it was. If I'd known what it was, I would have rejected it because clearly there is no higher power out there. In case you haven't heard, there isn't a guy in the sky. The sky is not what we thought it was. So I had that, that tape playing in me that made that not an accessible source. But I went anyway, and I found out some important things. The first was that happiness did not come from without. Happiness does not come from without. How much money I have, how much booze I have, how much sex I have, how much acknowledgement I have, 
how much fame, glory, or whatever else you can imagine that is without does not create happiness. Happiness is really an inside job, and happiness inside expresses outward. Per the other quote, which is perfect, that uh, some people make, make others happy wherever they go, and other people make people happy when they go. <laughs> and the reason that that fits perfectly is we attract what we, what we are. So if we are happy people, and most of you know happy people who are genuinely just feel good about life, they are fun to be around. And depressed, beaten, frightened people are generally not very much fun to be around. So I got that as the first kind of, wow, happiness within. Now I felt pretty empty within. The feeling that I felt was one of, and it's best characterized by being a megalomaniac with an inferiority complex. Now how that worked for me was, the part of me that was really smart and capable and could manipulate things on the outside and achieve things and be in front of people and talk like I knew something, still serves sort of, <laughs> was the megalomaniac. But the part of me that, in terms of how I felt about the world, everything frightened me. We were talking about our first dates the other night, and it was like, oh, Jesus, was that scary? Was that hard? Oh, my God. Anything I did, first time I spoke in front of a group of people, being with a group of classmates, and especially when they didn't seem to welcome me, whatever the situation was, there was a part of me that was terribly afraid. So those two, that, that kind of experience as I came into a different place, what I call a different level of consciousness through my collapse and then embracing another way of living and a, kind of a different set, a way of thinking about things, a kind of a path, is what I would call a shift in consciousness. So I became interested in how does that occur? It was amazing that it happened for me, and it's amazing to the extent that it happens, but I noticed that one, it was pretty hard, in fact impossible, it seemed like at times, to pass on to somebody else. It seemed like some people got it or they didn't. It was nice to witness and to support, but it was hard to, quote, cause. So I was curious about how that happened, why some people woke up and other people died, literally, and, and sometimes figuratively, which was even worse. So I was interested in that, and more in terms of myself, I was interested in the shifts that occurred in me because I noticed that even though at times I felt really wide open and receptive and able to be a fully alive and kind of embraced it, there are other times when I was, quote, the old me. It was like, gee, this is terrible. You know, this feels bad and I don't like it. What do I do about it? I am a person who likes maths. And this is partly, I reviewed this by reading Byron's book, because this is part of his story is using a map that was not very reliable. And the problems that that leads to. But I really like maps. So when I go to Guadalajara, I have the, the big red book map and I have the, all that detailed. I also get a Google map of where I'm going. So I have that printed out. And I have my GPS. And if it's some place that I don't know, I really like having Marissa or somebody else who's familiar with Guadalajara or who I think is familiar. I sometimes have taken people that didn't know much more than I did, but I thought they knew something. I like to have a guide. Those are my preferences. I like to know where I'm going. And the reason that I like to know where I'm going is reflected in a story that was told about Daniel Boone. So, everybody know who Daniel Boone is? He was, yeah, he's a guy who wore the, the, the uh, coonskin hat that I had as a five-year-old and a pretend. I didn't know it was a pretend, so it felt really authentic to me. He was once asked, have you ever been lost? because he was an explorer and went out in the middle of nowhere where nobody knew and there were no maps. And he said, no, I've never been lost, but there have been times when I didn't know where I was. <laughs> and I used to not understand that distinction, but now I do, at least for me. The distinction is, I frequently don't know where I am, but when I am lost, I have the feeling of fear and worry and anxiety 
Whereas, when I don't know where I am, I have a sense of adventure. I am alive and open to possibilities and not filled with fear. And those, that's a very significant shift in consciousness from being lost to not knowing where I am. I'm glad Patty spoke, because I've heard of her, you know, obviously heard of her the story, don't know her personally. But I recall that time when, when most of us here actually spent a bit of time in that place of fear. And fear is not a comfortable sensation. And it is not very functional to the human being. And there is a way of reacting to fear that is effective, and some that aren't. The usual one for most of us is the one pull back, to hide, sometimes run, and occasionally get angry and, and combat it. None of those actually work very well. Now in the theory, and one of the maps that I like of consciousness, is to look at it in an evolutionary sense. How many people are aware of the triune brain? That part of our brain is reptilian, part of it is early mammalian, and then part of it is, is kind of human, and that potentially it seems like part of it is actually a quote God center or something that is even transcends the, the neocortex human part. One way of thinking about our evolution as a species and our individual evolution is that the basic brainstem part of our brain has to do with danger. So reptiles know about danger, they flee it. And they also know about good. They eat it. <laughs> Plants do sort of the same thing. They go towards the light, and they tend to close up when it's like either too bright or when it's cold, right? They, they kind of have that sensation. They don't actually have fear either. Fear really starts with early mammalians where the, the midbrain, the limbic system, records scary things so we remember that's scary, and we know to flee before we know it's going to eat us. And that works very well for mammals. I was in Africa and saw zebras and wildebeest and lions looking for wildebeest and zebras. And when a zebra sees a lion, they run like hell. I mean, it's really good. They have a fear thing and they do something and it relieves the fear totally. Either they get eaten, fear ends, or they get away, fear ends. <laughs> Humans are unique that we make what was really adaptive, maladaptive. Because of our ability to remember, put together stories, and project into the future, hence the value of what Barbara was talking about in meditation, being really present in the now, because we can do that, we can experience fear in, about future, something that isn't even happening, isn't even close. We can imagine a lot the lion and have fear anytime we want to. It doesn't take a lion. We can use, do it in our own brain, and we frequently do. And that becomes a problem. It doesn't help us very much. It becomes a use of something that was very adaptive at that part of our brain and that time in our evolution that is, and is occasionally good if, if there are, if somebody has a, a large gun and they're aiming at us, it's, it's, it's good to have that, oops, I recall that that's a bad thing. I saw a movie about one of those going off and it wasn't good for the person that it was aimed at and it's good to get out of the way. So it's not totally bad or maladaptive, that can be useful. But generally speaking, all it does is cause us to be afraid, which the fear state puts us in a state of mind where we have very few options. It's, it's, it's run, freeze, or fight. And that, that state is, those may be good options, but, but they miss a whole bunch of options that are available. And for things that are not genuinely life-threatening, the experience of fear is usually is almost never adapted. For instance, being in a social situation 
or say speaking publicly, I'm a, I'm a card carrying postmaster uh, participant, so if you're interested in postmasters, talk to me, Marissa, or Maureen afterwards. If you're in public and you're not used to it and it's not comfortable, then the feeling of fear takes over and it becomes literally impossible in some cases or very difficult in other cases to speak at all. Right? The fear becomes overwhelming. The sense of what I ought to do is either get out of there or crouch down and hopefully they won't see me and occasionally become belligerent. But any, any of those responses that are conditioned are no longer effective for human beings and generally don't work. So part of our, our growth as a species is to move from taking fear literally and finding ways to adapt to it, having shifts in consciousness. Now the first thing we can do to overcome fear is to have courage. Courage is, all right, I know I'm afraid, but I really have to face this. There's a fight in the schoolyard and it's time to face your opponent, kind of, in that particular social context as if you're a young male. So, the message is, yes, I am afraid, but I'm going to use the anger part of it to take this guy on, or I'm going to run like heck. But, you know, but make a conscious decision and then act in a way that it works. That is one use of consciousness. The other, though, and, and then as it evolves, is to figure out more interesting and maybe more useful in life in general responses to fear. One response that I was very good at, and what I alluded to in my, my earlier development, was since it wasn't good, to pretend that it wasn't there. So, a tough, capable male is not afraid, right? Because if you're tough and capable, you are fearless. Therefore, since I am a tough, capable young male, or was at one time, <coughs> I am fearless. I don't allow that feeling to be present in me, or don't acknowledge it. I dissociate from it. And, as a result, I can be ferocious. In fact, as we can experience throughout our culture, many young males are dangerous because they don't know consciously, they refuse to know and acknowledge that they have fear, and they express themselves in ways to prove that they're not afraid which means beating the crap out of or doing other things to other people. So dissociating from that particular emotion is not helpful. More helpful is to know that it's there and then become comfortable with it and face the fear and move through that so that the fear itself is addressed separate from the outside situation which seemed to cause the fear. Remember I said the first thing I learned as I, quote, recovered from that state that I seemed to be conditioned into and that was my inheritance, when I moved beyond that in age 33 to consider different states, it's not that I was in a different state, but I started to consider different states, that allowed me to say, the problem with fear is not what I directed at, it's my problem in here is I address that and deal with the fact that it's inside of me and get to know why I'm afraid and say, well, is this a good response or not? And what are other responses? And then reprogram, in a sense, myself. Or just become comfortable with, yes, I am afraid, but accept it. And then address whatever's outside separately, not in that state of mind. Then I can be more, be more alive and more free. As long as my sole response to fear is to try to bury it and then act in ways to prove that I'm not afraid, I am not free. I'm very conditioned. If you look at the behavior of bands, they look the same all the world over. They could be 
Latino bands in, in, in LA or in here, or they can be African youth or European, you know, it doesn't matter where they came from, they look very, uh, very similar. That's why programs like 12-step programs work, because addiction, which is being stuck, looks the same regardless of who, who, who has it. It's, it, it is a, a something that brings us in our essential characteristics as human beings very close together. And, and it's like, wow, we all look really alike. The beauty of becoming free is that we no longer look the same. We can see that we're different and enjoy our differences. And it becomes a different life. Freedom opens up possibility and potential and lifts us up. It also lifts us to a place of being free from suffering, which is really being stuck in fear or in satisfying our appetites as our definition of happiness creating addiction, or is in a third level of consciousness. So where there's fear, there's stuff makes me feel good. If I eat, I feel, when I'm hungry, I feel good. Therefore, in order to feel good, I ought to eat. That paradigm, that's the addictive pleasure paradigm that is what addiction is generally about, substance abuse at least, in that, in that sense of addiction. The third level of of suffering is that of what I call control or security. It is based significantly on fear, but it also can be based on, I want to get mine and have enough. But it is looking at the future and saying, am I going to have enough money? And I'm, am I going to be safe? Am I going to get enough of whatever I'm taking in that I think gives me pleasure that I want to have? Am I going to be able to control my health and my circumstances, which I believe are really the outside world? How do I do that? How many have worried about their savings enough for retirement? How many have worried about their health care or their health? How many have worried about things that at this moment aren't relevant and equally importantly, at this moment, we cannot actually do anything about, really. Does that sound familiar to anybody? So it is this desire to, what I, say, what I call a desire to control, to obtain security, that drives a lot of the drama in life. Now, I'm not sure without the suffering of fear and, and the, what is involved in fear or gratification of ple pleasure or control that we would have any television, any telenovelas, or much of our literature. So I'm not sure we can exist without those. As a culture, it's nice to contemplate what that would look like. But as individuals, we can. And it starts with knowing that those levels of consciousness are what keep us down, keep us captive in our own lives, and which cause us suffering. Equally important, they cause us to cause others suffering. So in the control mode, if I'm concerned about whether my lovely wife is going to stay with me, I may, in my feeling of jealousy, try to get her to promise what to always be loyal. That's why I've, I've done performed wedding ceremonies, but all, part of it says, forever and ever, huh? <laughs> how do I know how I'm going to feel next year? Or whether it's even a good idea forever and ever at that point. It's, it's like, but it does sound a little superficial to say, well, I promise to love you yum, yum, yum as much as I can right now, and I don't know about tomorrow. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> But it is problematic to promise forever a certain state of being. We can barely promise how I'm going to feel today, let alone tomorrow. But this moment, maybe. That control, as I, as I alluded to, becomes problematic in terms of really living life fully. 
So how do we change? Well, the first thing and why I like the maps is because I can identify. Ah, I'm feeling fear, that means this. Or I'm, I'm feeling lust, and that means this. You know, it's a, it's a, both of those are God-given or nature-given natural parts of who we are. And when they are predominant experiences of life, they, are, they introduce problems of loss of freedom. And as I say, the same thing with control. Now, control is a more subtle, more subtle situation. For me, I know that I'm having problems with control when I'm getting frustrated or angry. I know that there are some theories of, of anger as being the opposite of fear or based on fear. And it's true in the sense, but the sense is that I'm going to lose something that I want to have that I think I should have, that I think I have control over, and that if I am more forceful, I can then garner control. And forceful may mean being more, sm more smart and, argu and argumentative and being able to assert myself with words. When you're my size, that becomes a better strategy than using for brute force. It's a different kind of force. And others have different levels and ways of asserting control, which sometimes look very nice. Some I even enjoy for a little while. So control can look different depending upon one's strategy. So what is the opposite? Or how do we, how do we transcend it, really? Trying to manipulate it and try to reduce it, medicate it, and or use strategies to lessen its effect. For instance, one of the ways I can have less concern over control, or the influence of being out of control with regard to the world economy, is never watch the news. <laughs> don't look at the ex currency exchange, and don't look at my bank statements. <laughs> if I just walk around, I'm less likely to be upset, right? So if Arlene always treats me nice, what I define as nice, i.e. not threaten or push one of my buttons, then maybe if she does it skillfully enough, I will never be upset. That's one way. The other way is to deactivate those buttons or those, those tendencies so that I can accept whatever stimulus there is from the outside and enjoy it without it meaning any of those things. How does that happen? Well, the first thing that for me happened aside from realizing that I was living in what I thought was the real world, which was really one that I had made, realizing that, oh, there's a whole other world possible, and then realizing, oh, I made that one too. Realizing that we really can continue to create our reality, not arbitrarily, but from certain patterns that allow us to live differently. That's what I call living consciously, is realizing that whatever state we're in, as we encounter problems, it implies not that something's wrong out there, but that there's a way of seeing, imagining, creating in our own mind that creates a different world. This is what I, what I call conscious living. It is developing a new consciousness with each situation, realizing the situation isn't there, it's here. Does that more or less make sense? If not, we have a whole course to discuss this. And the value of discussion is because even though I have read many books and had very wise teachers, 99% of what they said and what I read, I have not, they're not, they're not part of went through. Well, well, I was like, I remember that. I was like, what did he say? It's only when it becomes part of us that we use it that it changes us that any amount of information is valuable. That's why I'm not worried about being brainwashed or brainwashing anybody because we only accept in that which we can use and we use it and if it works for us, we keep it. And if, we, if it doesn't make sense to us, we don't take it in. If it makes sense to us and we think it ought to be good but we can't use it, it's gone too. The only things that we get that change us are things that help us. Our biggest problem is being afraid of something that might change us because it might change us. That, that, that it, therefore it might be threatening. Once we lose our fear of being changed 
and have confidence in our ability to know what change we want to embrace that will evolve our life and give us a greater expression of life, then we become fearless because we no longer have to worry about what they, whether it be evil communists that I was brought up with or Islamic fundamentalists that I've, I've, we've, we've been exposed to that being the threat, or Christian evangelicals or whatever, name your, your kind of their different watch out for them group of people. There is no watch out for them group of people. There's only watch out for my fear person that is not my enemy, but is my dancing partner that allows me to move forward and gain a richer life. I think I'm approaching our time. As I said, we, we do have a, a course which is designed to do what I think is most valuable. I, I don't Oh, here's a flyer. My wife has a flyer <laughs> and has a sign-up list. But it's not, I have found, under the, tree. under the tree, I have found I can't teach anybody anything. And that I am unteachable. I hate it when people try to teach me something. Because there's part of me that says you're trying to teach me something. <laughs> and there's part of me that is a little concerned. But I have found that having discussions about trying to, to, to look at and reflect on how I live and how I actually react and handle things and compare that both in terms of what my past experience and what I'm doing now and comparing that with what other people are doing and how they see it, that sometimes I learn something. So although I'm unteachable, I sometimes cheat and I learn something. I copy. Oh. Hmm, that might be a good idea. Let me try that. Or not. So, if you're interested, that's the kind of stuff we, we do and I do. And that I like more than talking, although I love talking, as you may have gathered. And with that, I will we'll close with this thought. May your journey be full of wonder, of new learning, and of freedom. May you release the past and the future, release fear and anger, and enjoy, enjoy the life that is yours. Again, you hold up your hand, and someone will bring you a mic. Over here, we have somebody again. Please hold your hand up so I can see. Okay. Now, this is kind of a difficult question, but are you easy to live with? Actually, that's a perfect question. No, I'm, I'm serious. When I was in 12-step program, one of the things that my, my sponsor would ask in terms of, you know, people would say, well, how are things going? And people would say, well, you know, my job's going, I'm making money, I'm doing this. And the question he would ask is, how are things going at home? How are things going at home? And you'd have to ask my wife. I, I think so, but I've always thought I was easy to live with, even when clearly in retrospect I wasn't, so I'm not sure that I'm the, the best witness to that, but ask, ask those who know me. I only ask because I'm not that easy to live with. Right. So <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, think, I, think there, I think that all of us wish to be, quote, easy to live with, because it's easier to enjoy other people and have closeness if we're quote easy to live with. So yeah, no, I think that's a that that was one of the things I wanted to get that I when I was 30 and I realized that not only was I not easy to live with, but we hadn't lived in the same world for quite a while. So I felt a lot of distance. It wasn't just not, I wasn't easy to live with. I was impossible. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay. I haven't even quite fabricated this question, but maybe it'll take shape as I speak. I'm sure we all um, know someone like this. I'm thinking of a good friend of mine who, um, I would say, lives in a lot of fear. And she asks me for advice all the time about her particularly hard situation. And I feel kind of bewildered about, well, first of all, who am I to give her advice? And but second of all, I feel like really it's not about advice, it's about, well, if you really looked at your fear, then you'd make a little progress solving this problem. Because really what's happening is you're not facing the things that are terrifying you and you're just reenacting everything over and over and over again. So I don't know if you have some thoughts about that, I'm sure you do. Yes, the first is that I've found it rarely valuable when people have either given me advice or I've given advice. As, as one person said, here, take my advice, I'm not using it. <laughs> it gives it a characteristic that we all have. And, and it generally, uh, it's like, usually, what, what I'm struck with is that the solution that I see for a person's problem is so obvious to me that the real question is not why they're not, is, is what about their, their perspective, their, their consciousness, that would make that so they haven't seen that possibility? Because, and it goes back to what I, one of the things I, I got from Albert Einstein was when he was asked how, how long would it take to solve a problem? And he said about an hour, and, he, and they said, well, how? And he said, well, I would need 55 minutes to know what was the question, <laughs> and only five minutes to solve the problem. So in this case, I would say, yes, what is the question in terms of, I want, in some sense, to be of help or support, or I care about the person. I think that real, recognizing that, that you have some caring about her is a very good sign in my book, because I think one of the, the first things above the level that I was stuck in these three things of fear, control, and, and, and getting get in mind, was that I was totally self-focused. So one of the signs of, of, of a healthy evolution is with people who are actually concerned about somebody without, without it being, you know, I'm concerned about you because if you're not okay, you won't cook dinner tomorrow, or you know, without any strings attached concern. Uh, and my personal thought about people in fear is to, is to really ask them about it. How does it feel? What, you know, ask more about the fear itself, and, and, and then just be a friend, really. My personal thoughts about what I do in that kind of situation, because I rarely feel like I've got an answer for them, but sometimes in the conversation some of just caring and sharing, something comes up that is helpful for them. They'll say all this. And I've had experiences when I've given talks in different situations where people will, will later say, boy, you said this, and I got it, and it changed my life, and I know that I didn't say anything like that. <laughs> didn't say anything like that, but I'm glad that the, in the presence of whatever was happening, which is, I think, what happens when we're among people that, that care for us and we feel safe, which I think this is that kind of an environment, that when we're in that environment and we feel good about ourselves and about life, we are more open to our possibilities and less constricted in our fear. So in other words, no, I don't have an answer. <laughs> Thanks, too. Uh, this isn't really a question, but I wanted to share something that relates to what you've been talking about that I learned some years ago from a psychologist friend, and that is that our fear is, a, is an emotion, it's a feeling, and our feelings come from our thoughts. So if you want to change our feelings, we have to begin by changing our thoughts, what we're thinking about. I think that's why we escape and go to movies and read books. And so, um, you want to change your feelings, change your thoughts. And that, that happens to be very 
homes in. I said I things look better in this home. Besides the mind, it's it's change your your level of consciousness or change your way of thinking, and you change your life. Why I like the ma kind of quote, maps of consciousness is so that I can realize what kind of thoughts I'm having. So if I'm dwelling on fearful thoughts and seeing the world, how I'm seeing the world is through this lens. This is a damn scary place, and I don't know if there's an armed guy over there or a you know a, a treacherous woman over there or whatever. I'm then I'm going to be you know yeah I'll have the, the predominant feeling will be fear, and it's because I'm having thoughts. I'm interpreting the the world in a certain way, and that there are other ways of interpreting. In other words, get a new map. Another question? Oh. Where? Ah. One of the things I find very useful, if I want a different answer, ask a different question. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, indeed. What is the right question? I'm waiting for the right question. Well, here's the question. I don't know if it's the right question, but um, you stated before that in order to overcome fear, you had to find courage within yourself. And since the two states of being are pretty much an antithetically inclined to one another, how does one find courage? Is there a process? Are there steps to take? Where does that courage come from, and how do you access it? I think that would be great topic, and, and we do topics, and, and, and I think that would be a good one that would be great to hear what each person's thought are. My thought is that I think of the possibility of overcoming whatever this is, one, and helped by the, the, the thought that, the, that this, whatever is outside of me, is not inherently fearful, that the fear is my response to it. So that knowing Sort of, we talk about the in our opening statement that there's kind of a higher self. The higher self part of me, knowing and observing the part of me that's afraid and saying, oh, that's just you know having that experience, and it will pass, as Barbara alluded to, and, and that there's probably a better response, and then be thinking about the better response. So, for instance, many people, um, if they're faced with some adversity, their first tendency is to face the adversity. Oh crap, I don't have any money, I don't have any money, I don't have, I'm, I'm sick, I'm sick. It's, when, when the attention is shifted to here's how you can get some money or here's how you can get health care. In fact, as a doctor, what I would find is many people were relieved when they finally got their self, themselves to see me because they could at least explore the possibility of getting better. Up until that point, they had a symptom which they, which they were fearful about, which, which, which in their mind meant they were going to die. So a lot of the things that I did were to, to actually prove people, to help prove people so that they could grasp the idea that they no, they were not going to die. So it was actually uh, the opposite of what we normally think of or uh, has been commonly taught. You go to the doctor to, to be cured of something that otherwise will kill you. No, it's to be it's really to be relieved of the fear that might, well, maybe not kill you, but will make you very miserable. I think we, we're getting signs that it's time to bring this to a close. I'm free to talk to, I guess we're going to meet at the, the tree. Uh, and, oh, yeah, that's right. I, I said, we're it didn't talking. scare you at all. Did it didn't scare me too bad because he's that far away. <laughs> <laughs> I learned to manage my fear. Thank you so much. is November 10th. We're going to have a universal remembrance day of service here. It seems that um, nearly everyone, uh, well not, I don't know, nearly everyone, but so many of the men here have served in some uh, armed forces somewhere in their lifetime or been involved in that situation. Um, and men and women of all nationalities live in our community and participate in the weekly gatherings here. Um, so this November 10th, next Sunday at 10.30, we're going to present a program honoring all veterans. 
and whatever their country of origin. And Mark Scott, James Pippen, and I will be reading on the subject of war and remembrance from the great literature on the subject, really, in English. David Bryan will be moderating, and all are welcome. I'd like to make a reminder again about this wonderful trip to Chapman, and uh, if, you'd like, if you have any interest at all, consult the bulletin board. So, I guess that concludes today. Uh, pick, no? Oh, cell phone. <laughs> turn them on, turn them on. <laughs> and pick up your coffee cups and both of them correctly. And that's your chair. Thank you for coming.